Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the very first Louisa Dunkley oration. My name is Sina, and together with my friend Beth, we are your MCs for the evening. We are a part of Project O in Frankston North. Project O is a really great program where we get to build our skills and confidence to speak up about things that are important to us. We are so excited to be your hosts for this event, which we think will empower all of us here to think of the ways we can contribute to positive community change. Even though we can't be here together in person, it's really great that we can still celebrate the very first Louisa Dunkley oration with you all today. Before we begin, we respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we come together on today, the Bunwarang people. We acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to this land and pay our respect to their elders, both past, present and emerging. We also recognize the outstanding achievements of all First Nations people and the important contributions they make, they make to their urban, regional and remote communities. We recognize the powerful and important ways their work and voices have affected and continue to affect positive change. We would now like to welcome President and Vice Chancellor of Monash University, Professor Margaret Gardner, AC, to officially open the oration. Good evening. It gives me very great pleasure to welcome everyone here this evening to the inaugural Louisa Dunkley Oration, albeit in a different format than originally planned, but despite the ongoing challenges and uncertainties that COVID-19 continues to bring, uh, even as recently as, as in the last week or so, we're very pleased you could join us. I would also like to begin by acknowledging the people of the Kulin Nations and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And given this evening's event, I think it's important that we particularly acknowledge the achievements of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, their strength, resilience, and indeed the considerable contributions they've made to shaping the cultures of this country throughout its history. But I'd also like to give my very special thanks to Peter Murphy, the federal member for Dunkley. We are so thankful to her for inviting Monash University to host this very special occasion. And in particular, it is my very great pleasure to thank uh, and welcome the Honourable Julia Gillard AC for being here with us this evening. It seems more than fitting at this time that it is she who gives not just this oration, but this inaugural oration. The Louisa Dunkley oration is, of course, named in honour of the late Louisa Dunkley, a union leader and proud feminist who spent many years of her life campaigning for the equal rights of women. Today, her remarkable legacy and her name lives on in this oration. Louisa Dunkley fought for an important cause. Unfortunately, it's not a cause where we can declare that it is over or that it has been won. And it is, but it is a cause that speaks strongly to everyone, I believe, and it speaks to, strongly to and through Monash University's mission. The focus on gender equity and inclusivity has been fundamental to Monash for its history. You might say Monash University grew up with campaigns for rights and for recognition of those who are often left outside the full range of opportunities our society affords. Each year, we continue to reflect on the university's journey in this space and consider how we might apply what we've learned to advance diversity and equity further still. We're proud of the work we've done and continue to do to foster an organisational culture that's inclusive and, which, and in which staff of all genders, of or a variety of cultural backgrounds, faiths and heritage, heritages participate equally at all levels in what we believe is a collective pursuit of excellence. We wish to be recognised as a leader in gender equity in higher education in Australia, but also internationally. And in 2019, in the first attempt by the Times Higher Education to measure university impact against the United Nations Sustainability, Sustainability Development Goals, which include uh, gender equality, Monash ranked 24th in the world on gender equality last year. We're proud of that achievement, but we know there's still a lot to be done here in our backyard and across all our campuses. 
Um, Monash was also part of the Australia-wide Respect Now Always University campaign to eliminate sexual harassment and sexual violence. And we've been cited for best practice in, a, in relation to a number of aspects of our continuing work in this area. I think none of us need to be reminded by recent events about how important building respectful cultures is. So women make up, in fact, the majority of Monash staff, some 56%, and about the same percentage of our students. Yet, as in many other fields, our staff in senior roles, the number in, among our staff in senior roles, the percentage of women is considerably less than that 56%. We know that the journey for women in terms of their opportunities and the outcomes they seek is often long, it's competitive, and indeed the many, many things that happen in their lives and the care that they provide for many people has impacts on how they are treated, usually in work compared to others. We know, however, that the greater the diversity and equity we have in leadership, the better the outcomes in universities, in teaching, learning and research. We also know it's better for all of us in our communities. Um, I mentioned earlier that this wasn't how we'd envisaged this event. Um, we find ourselves meeting online rather than in person. Uh, and we know, in fact, that as with most crises, they have a disproportionate effect on the disadvantaged and that this crisis, COVID-19, has had a disproportionate effect on women and particularly those people with caregiving responsibilities. It's taught all of us many things this last 12 months but it teaches us again and again how we have to monitor and understand how the unexpected, the crisis in the world highlights the impacts of any forms of inequality. And that's also true in the university. And we've worked hard to look at how those impacts have affected the women who work and study with us. We know that all of us collectively need to work on ensuring we don't lose sight of gender equity goals in the middle of economic crisis, crises. And what we know that gender equality is not a women's issue, it's everyone's issue. And that gender equality and what is necessary to achieve it is essential for all our communities to thrive. I wanna say that I'm really pleased that we have Peter Murphy and the Honourable Julia Gillard with us this evening because they've done that most amazing thing and that's gone on to represent us in our democracy in a circumstance where Parliament is not actually a place that's dom that in which women have gender parity and in which forging their careers and their ability to speak for all of us, but indeed recognising the impacts of gender inequality has been very important. Well, I just want to say I'm proud that in 2021, Monash for women in senior professional roles is actually 50-50 male and female. Um, women in um, all senior roles, not just the professional roles, but across academic and professional has also grown, but is not at gender parity. We're getting close to 40%. Um, but we know there's still a lot to be done because it's not just whether people are in roles, but what the culture is, whether the culture is one that welcomes all people and gives all people um, the opportunities for which, which we all strive for. As professionals, as educators and as researchers, I feel in universities, a considerable burden of action must fall to us in challenging the biases, conditioning and assumptions that form many of the barriers to achieving gender equity and embracing diversity. That's why we were thrilled to host this oration and, and so thrilled by being asked by Peter Murphy and, and having the Honourable Julia Gillard give it. I look forward to, to tonight's Louisa Dunkley oration being the first of many, and I know it will be very significant. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Please now welcome Federal Member for Dunkley, Peter Murphy, MP, to share with you more about 
Louisa Dunkley and her incredible achievements. Thank you so much, uh, Sina and Beth. I am so proud of both of you and Makaya, who everyone will meet later. The three of you represent how wonderful um, the young people in our community are. Um, and we're just so thrilled that you could be part of tonight. Um, I, this morning, had the uh, privilege uh, to yet again visit our local First Nations gathering place, Nurma Jambana, um, which is doing a project recording the history and the stories of the aunties, the female leaders, and I met a number of local aunties and traditional owners. Um, and it was fitting that that happened today and I want to pay my respects to all of them and I'm very much looking forward to hearing all of their stories. It's obviously my privilege to host tonight with Monash University Peninsula Campus and um, look I'm just going to tell you this I think this is the proudest moment um, of me of my time so far as a member um, for Dunkley uh, after getting sworn in um, because Louisa Dunkley is someone who has inspired me and I am very sure that her story will inspire girls and boys and men and women from across our community and more broadly once her story is known. Um, while there's a bit of disappointment that we couldn't all be together tonight, if nothing else the last 12 months has taught us that we have to adapt and be grateful for what we do have. Louisa Dunkley was a woman who didn't come from particular wealth or privilege. Um, her father died when she was relatively young and someone had to provide for her family. So in 1882, Louisa entered the Victorian Postmaster General's Department as a junior assistant. Over the next decade, she worked her way up to becoming a telegraphist at the Chief Telegraph Office. And as her career progressed, so did her indignation at the unfair paying conditions of her female colleagues. Louisa Dunkley was a worker. She was a feminist and in 1895, she became a trade unionist. The Victorian Telegraph Union of the mid 1890s wouldn't admit women as its members and it certainly wouldn't advocate for their workplace rights. So Louisa and her female colleagues took the cause into their own hands and the Victorian Women's Post and Telegraph Association was born. On behalf of that association, Louisa went before the Victorian Colonial Public Service Classification Board and she advocated for women to be paid the same as their male colleagues. Her advocacy was described at the time as brilliant and she won pay increases for the women of that office. Meanwhile, the men whose union had refused to make submissions for fear of putting the colonial government offside received pay cuts. So it's fair to say that not everyone was so pleased with that outcome. In an attempt to isolate Louisa from her female colleagues and supporters, the masters of the Post and Telegraph Office transferred her to a more remote workplace. But they didn't really think that through. She worked at the Post and Telegraph Office, where the means of communication were pretty readily available. So undaunted, Undaunted by opposition from those who resisted change and those who protected power, Louisa continued her campaign, attracting like-minded men and women to her cause. In 1900, she gained endorsement at the first National Congress of Telegraph and Post Office Associations to argue for equal pay in the soon to be formed Federal Public Service. She also played an important role in uniting those associations into what later became Australia's first National Public Service Union. Under Louise's leadership, two more years of letter writing, lobbying, pamphleteering and demonstrating, activities that Julia Gillard and I are well um, familiar with, and I'm sure a number of you uh, listening to this today are as well. Those activities led to the inclusion of an equal pay provision in the Commonwealth Public Service Act in 1902, almost single-handedly because of Louise's drive and ability to get people on her side. It would be a remarkable achievement at any time, but it was particularly so at that time. And after securing that historic achievement, Louisa wrote these words. Though at first we only asked for equal pay as an act of justice to those women who had been doing the same work as men, now we advocate it as the only solution as to how to keep up the value of work 
and provide fair opportunities for employment of both men and women in the future. Well, in 2021, living in that future, as you've just heard um, from the Vice Chancellor, we still have some way to go to achieve Louise's aims. Across every occupation, women are paid less than men, and the work which is predominantly done by women remains systemically undervalued. And women sadly continue to be underrepresented in positions of leadership across all workplaces, including my new one, Australia's Parliament. Louisa Dunkley lived and fought for her values, for fairness, for equality, and for the power of collective action to improve and strengthen community. We could all do much worse than follow in her footsteps. And to honour her, we now have in our community the Louisa Dunkley Oration. I hope you're as excited as I am to hear our wonderful and amazing guest speaker, who I will now hand over uh, to our wonderful students who are hosting tonight to introduce. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Peter. Michaela Goggin is an incredible young person from Frankston who has strived to make a positive impact in the Frankston community. In 2020, Michaela was awarded Frankston's Young Citizen of the Year. We now like to look We'd now love to welcome Michaela to introduce this evening's key speaker. So this speaker needs no introduction. However, I am going to give it a shot. <laughs> the Honourable Julia Gillard AC is an icon and an inspiration to many. She's helped pave a path for young women like me, empowering them to achieve despite adversity. Becoming the first and only female Australian Prime Minister is not something to take lightly. Ms. Gillard has created a path for other women to follow. Ms. Gillard used her platform to better this nation through her work with NDIS Foreign Affairs, her focus on women's rights, children's rights, and her dedication in helping to reduce Australia's carbon footprint. Dealing with our climate emissions reduction is sadly work that we have yet to see as a priority in other Australian prime ministers. Ms. Gillard is a courageous woman. She stood up to misogyny, exemplifying the strength and power of all women by standing strong despite ongoing attacks from the likes of the media, other parliamentarians, and he who shall not be named. <laughs> <laughs> he in empowering many and has been a cornerstone in the acceptance by society around women in leadership. Miss Gillard is tireless. Post politics, she joined Beyond Blue as its chair. She was the first former prime minister to run a not-for-profit organization since Malcolm Fraser. Ms. Gillard has ensured that Beyond Blue achieved its very worthy mandate of providing support to those who suffer from a variety of mental illnesses. Additionally, Ms. Gillard is a chairwoman of the Global Partnership for Education. Achieving equality in global education is incredibly important for a whole host of reasons, none more significant than addressing the most existential questions facing humanity. I am so happy to know someone of her caliber is involved in this endeavor. Equally, it is great to note that Ms. Gillard is chair of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership, addressing women's underrepresentation in leadership. Knowing this organization exists and that Ms. Gillard is a part of it makes me hopeful for a fairer future, perhaps one not so driven by testosterone. Further, Ms. Gillard is an honorary professor at the University of Adelaide and as an honorary doctorate from the University of Canberra for her work in education and gender equality. She's definitely the right woman for any job. Aside from being a former prime minister, an exemplary leader and a champion of equality in education, she's able to add author to her achievements, publishing my story in 2014 and more recently, the co-authored Women and Leadership, Real Lives and Real Lessons. Ms. Gillard has always seemed to have Australia's best interests at heart. She pushed for Australia to be its better self. And as a result, I truly think we are. It is with great pleasure that I introduce the Honourable Julia Gillard, AC. Thank you. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and in a spirit of reconciliation, pay my respects to elders past and present. Thank you, Peter, Professor Gardner, Michaela for that wonderful introduction. I'm so glad to be with all of you here today in this virtual format. Of course, we first planned this oration for the start of last year, 
The gathering pandemic meant that it quickly became clear that we would have to reschedule our initial date. However, I don't think any of us imagined then the shape of the 12 months that would follow and the continuing need to be converting in-person events to virtual ones a year later. Thank you, Peter, for your continued willingness to host this oration and your ingenuity in making sure that we could still come together tonight and celebrate Louisa Dunkley's legacy. Thank you too, Peter, for being a woman who fights for your community while demonstrating what it is to show personal courage. In your first speech to our nation's parliament, you quoted Pippi Longstocking, the children's book character, describing herself as the strongest girl in the world. In that spirit, I would describe you as one of the strongest women I know in this world. You inspire us and I simply want to say thank you for being so awesome. But of course, I'm here to talk about another strong woman, Louisa Dunkley. It isn't easy to be a feminist, unionist and gender pay advocate today, but I ask you to imagine how hard it would have been in the second half of the 1800s and in the early days after our nation federated. Yet undaunted, Louisa Dunkley was all of these things. She stood up for what she believed in and kept standing up for it, despite being subjected to what an inquiry found to be deplorable actions. Like Peter, courage was one of her defining characteristics. All those who care deeply about creating a better and more equitable world stand on the shoulders of giants like Louisa Dunkley, the trailblazers who marked out the path for us. We best honour her memory tonight by looking forward as well as back and by specifically asking ourselves the critical question of our age. What is the best way of shaping our world post the COVID-19 pandemic so that it offers greater opportunity and freedom from the stigma and barriers of gender equality and every other form of prejudice and bias that divides our world. While Louisa Dunkley was of a different time and era, we can and should ask, what does it mean to put her timeless values into action now? Answering that requires us to be informed by the best of evidence, as well as a motivating spirit of action. Since the pandemic began, my wonderful colleagues at the Global Institute for Women's Leadership based at King's College London have been amassing the relevant research. I have proudly chaired the Institute since 2018, and it works on understanding and addressing the causes of women's underrepresentation in leadership positions across sectors and countries, and the way gender negatively impacts the evaluation of women leaders. We have now launched a sister institute here in Australia, which I am thrilled about. Through all this work, we can now identify the ripple effects from this pandemic on gender, the ripple effects that are impacting our world from the centre of the health crisis. Of course, the first of those ripple effects is the fact that this health crisis has put under the greatest strain and most at risk, those in the health and caring professions. This workforce is disproportionately women. And then if we go to the next ripple effect from the pandemic, what we see is an impact on women in the home. As various lockdowns have taken place, we know from research that it is disproportionately women who have stepped up to the new forms of domestic labour including homeschooling, even whilst also carrying full-time jobs. We know too around the world that domestic violence agencies have been the subject of huge record demand and that home is not a safe space for many women. Looking at the next ripple out, what we see in our economy is the way in which this recession caused by the pandemic is different from recessions in the past. Historically, economic downturns have tended to be about full-time jobs, male jobs, 
in sectors that were under acute pressure like manufacturing. This recession is disproportionately about women's jobs. It is about women who perform work part-time, casually, in sectors like hospitality and retail, which are disproportionately feminised. We know that these ripple effects around our world unaddressed will bequeath to us a future after the pandemic that is less gender equal than the one we were headed towards before the pandemic. This is an issue for women, but it's also an issue for girls because we know from studying earlier health crises, particularly the Ebola epidemic, that when schools close in poorer parts of the world, the most marginalised children don't make it back to school when schools reopen. And the most marginalised children are more likely than not to be girls. And so after schools has, have closed, they are at risk of early marriage, of being used as child labourers, or even being trafficked, and they simply don't get back to school with the opportunities that that would bring for their life's future. Now, I know talking about those ripple effects sounds like a lot of doom and gloom, but I genuinely believe that we also have a huge positive opportunity now to build a different future, to come out of this pandemic saying to ourselves that we don't want to go back to where we were before, we don't want to just see the legacy of this pandemic shape our future. Instead, we want to positively choose a different future, fuller of opportunity and particularly better for gender equality. What would that future look like? Well, first, I think it would be one in which we reevaluate the work and its value that has been done and has got us through this pandemic. What we know as a community now, both here in Australia and around the world, is the most valuable jobs in our society aren't the bankers on Wall Street or anything like that. It is the undervalued caring professions that are disproportionately women's work. And we can take with us into this new future a preparedness to reevaluate that labour and to pay and respect it properly. Second, as we rebuild our economies, I think we can rebuild working conditions in a way which means that we no longer want to see working people and disproportionately women trapped in insecure jobs, which don't offer them the benefits of uh, security, including income security, job security, and consequently the foundation stones on which to build their lives. Third, I think we can say that we want to take the best of this technology into the future with us. Of course, no one would wish to endlessly be working in a remote way, and certainly no one around the world would be endlessly wishing to combine that with lockdown pressures and homeschooling. But for many occupations, not all occupations, we have learned new things this year about the merits of this technology and how it can enable both women and men to better combine work and family life. If we focus on these issues, then I do genuinely believe we can emerge with a stronger, more gender equal future in front of us. But it's going to take leadership. And on that, I believe there are some positive signs as well. There has been a lot of dialogue about leadership during the pandemic, leadership globally, and many strong female leaders have been praised for getting their nations through this pandemic. I'm thinking of leaders like Jacinda Ardern in our own region of the world, who have managed to combine strength and empathy as they have guided their communities through. So people have known that they've got the strength to lead in a tough crisis, but the empathy and kindness to understand how the community is feeling at this uncertain moment. What has certainly not prospered in this era is an ultra macho testosterone driven view of leadership, the swagger of leaders like President Donald Trump and the president of Brazil, President Bolsonaro, 
who thought because in the past they'd been able to bluster their way through political crises that they would be able to do it again. Only to find, of course, that a virus isn't interesting, interested in your uh, macho or your posturing. A virus is going to get on and do what it does, which is replicate itself and infect more human beings. And so I think this means that we are well positioned to have a real debate about the kind of leadership that we want for the future, the kind of leaders we now as a global community are going to seek out and demand. I also see a positive sign in the way in which reason and science is increasingly winning through. We came to this pandemic out of an era in which, particularly in the context of climate policy, there had been a lot of scepticism and debunking of science. And yet, in the days of this pandemic, each of us, all of us, has been hooked watching reports from chief medical officers and other scientists, knowing that their knowledge, their expertise, uh, the work that has been done by those who have produced the various vaccines, that it is this science that is going to get us through. I think that means that not only with a refreshed view about the kind of leadership we want, we could take a refreshed view with us about the best way of making policy for the future. The best kind of evidence being brought by strong and empathetic leaders to bear on the toughest problems of our day. That would be truly an incredible legacy to come out of these challenging times that we have faced as a global community. But that new future isn't gonna build itself. It's only going to be built if activists around the world, women and men, lift their voices and have them heard as we shape that new future. In doing precisely that, which is what I would advocate you do in the months and years to come, I believe we can learn a lot from the spirit of Louisa Dunkley, a woman who was prepared to stand up in the toughest of circumstances, a woman who would have been constantly told that the things she believed were pipe dreams, a woman who was the subject of direct pressure, a woman who in every sense, in terms of her vision of the world, was leading and was thinking about the far horizon, the things that many others who shared that era with her weren't thinking about at all. I think if we channel that creative spirit, then we as the community nationally and globally can come through in this pandemic in a way which we can all say to ourselves would make Louisa proud. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to give this inaugural Louisa Dunkley oration. Thank you. Uh, Julia, thank you so much. Um, in all of my imaginings about what the inaugural Louisa Dunkley oration might be, I'm not sure that I even hit the heights of your speech and it's possible to admire you any more than I did before. <laughs> uh, that has happened. Um, and um, thank you for your unexpected and incredibly kind words um, about me as well. Uh, we are now going to move into the question and answer um, phase of tonight. Um, and um, the people who are in charge of the technology will have myself uh, and Julia and Margaret on the screen. Um, I'm not sure if we're on simultaneously or uh, one at a time. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm hoping that this will be an interesting conversation. Uh, but I thought it was fitting, particularly as we've been talking about inspiring other people um, to stand up and believe that they can achieve um, in many ways. But I ask firstly um, questions on behalf of one of my youngest constituents, Maggie, um, who I know is watching and Maggie's 10 years old and she emailed through some questions for you, Julia. So I'm just going to read it out in Maggie's words, if that's all right. Hi, my name is Maggie and I'm 10 years old. My questions are, 
Did Julia Gillard have to make any sacrifices to be Prime Minister? Was Julia Gillard nervous to become Prime Minister? And did Julia Gillard go to university? Thank you, Maggie. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Maggie. What a great set of questions. And the short answer is yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> yes, I did go to university. Uh, I felt incredibly privileged to go to, firstly, my local university. I grew up in Adelaide and I went to Adelaide University. And then a little bit later on, I went to Melbourne University. Sadly, I ne never made it to Monash University, but it's a long life and you never know. There might be a future educational qualification in my future. And yes, there are sacrifices to be made when you put your heart and soul into uh, making change and into a position that you very much love. And I know Peter would feel this too. Uh, serving your community as a member of parliament takes uh, your time and energy, almost all of it. Uh, and as you rise up in politics to a position like prime minister, it takes even more from you. And so there are things about family and friends and those sorts of things that you don't get to do as much of as you would like to. But I think that they understand when you're doing something as important as shaping the, the, the world, trying to make it better, uh, that they're very supportive of you on that journey. And that's how I always felt. And yes, there were times that I was very nervous as Prime Minister, nervous generally, uh, because of course, you're trying to do your best and there are many stresses and strains and nervous specifically about big occasions. But one thing that I've learned along the way is you can quell those nerves and you can do some things where you genuinely surprise yourself. And Maggie, something tells me that lies in your future. Uh, Thank you, Julia, and thank you, Maggie. I agree, I think that might lie in her future. Um, I wondered if I might ask Margaret a question um, now, because we do have a panel of firsts tonight. Um, of course, Julia, you are the first woman to ever be the Prime Minister of Australia. I'm the first woman to represent Dunkley in the federal parliament, which is, um, pretty amazing when we know who it's named after, uh, Louisa. Um, and Margaret is the first woman to be Vice Chancellor of Monash University, um, which occurred in 2014. Although she had, of course, previously been the Vice Chancellor of RMIT and the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Queensland. Um, and I just wondered, Margaret, if you might be willing to reflect a little bit on what it meant to you to be the first woman um, and perhaps whether there was anything that you experienced in particular as a result of being the first. Oh, Here's the IT um, allowed. Oh, yeah. there you are. Excellent. Um, <laughs> what I will say is uh, it's, it's distinctly less of a first than being the first female prime minister because there certainly <laughs> there hadn't, been, there hadn't been many women vice chancellors in Australia before me and... They are still in a minority, but I was definitely not the first woman to be a vice chancellor. So it wasn't a completely unexpected um, uh, intervention on the scene. Um, but what I would reflect on is that when I, and, and you, you sort of don't think about it, you apply and um, you're very pleased to be chosen in this case because it's an appointment, not not an election, it's a smaller group of people who get to make a decision. Um, but I think that when I looked back, what struck me and the thing I want to reflect on is that there had been, in all walks of life, there are, there are places and jobs, even if it's got the same title, that are seen as carrying... Um, carrying more weight, if you like, more reputation. So there are, there are universities that are seen as, with, as universities with higher reputations than others. And it is typically the case that they are very much less likely to have women and that when you look into their history, you find that if they've had a woman vice chancellor, it will be quite recent. 
And so when you look at the largest and at least reputedly the most prestigious in Australia, um, it's actually the case that of the largest five, only, only one of them has had a female vice chancellor and that is Monash and that is me. There you go. And that's comparatively late. And the reason I reflect on it is not because, oh, isn't it wonderful, it's me. <laughs> no, it is, it is, it is, it is. I'm reflecting on it because it tells you something really fundamental about the gender inequalities and the, that we are battling. That, that what we are battling are things that are deep in cultures. And so the more those things depend on people making judgments about who could be seen as plausible in those roles. And that, of course, goes to prime ministers, I might add, <laughs> in spades as well. Then the culture, the biases, the way people evaluate people's performance, the, the type of um, career that you probably have to have had to even get to be considered. Mm. Um, I think... Julia and I can probably say one thing, we've not had any career interruptions. That, you, you know, so, so women come into situations where the more prestigious, the harder it is. That tells you something fundamental about the culture. That tells you how big the task is in front of us. And that is as true for women as for people from uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, et cetera, et cetera, wherever you hit disadvantage, if you run out prestige, it is harder to break through the cultural assumptions than it is to legislate for what should be the minimum to which people are entitled. And the, and the one is absolutely vital. You have to have legislated minimums for um, equality. But unless you can break through how people see other people, yeah. who they think is entitled and should be entitled, then unless you break culture, nothing much changes. Yes, well, um, I'm very proud to be on uh, this panel with uh, two women and can I also say three young women who I think are doing exactly that. Um, although I didn't mean to praise myself, but you know what I meant. Um, <laughs> Julia, I wanted to ask you a question just to slightly change track for just a moment um, because we know that uh, you're the chair of Beyond Blue um, and I would imagine that when you took that position of chair, you thought about how you might approach that particular role of leadership um, and what you might want to achieve. And then of course, uh, COVID hit um, and it must have impacted not just your role, but how you discharged it. Um, and Cheryl, who I hope managed to get online, um, who's a pretty amazing woman in our community, does a lot of work with the Vietnam Veterans um, Association. She's a partner of Vietnam Vet, was interested to hear your reflections um, on that question of being the chair of Beyond Blue. Sure, thanks for the question and, and Cheryl for being online. I mean, this has been uh, an extraordinary year for the whole world, for our nation, uh, but also for Beyond Blue as a result. So I think uh, everybody would know that Beyond Blue is a very trusted organisation by the Australian community. Uh, the community can rely on it for support in a variety of ways. Uh, one of them is our telephone line where you call and you speak to a mental health professional. Uh, but people also engage with our many digital offerings which can take you uh, online to a mental health professional or into a chat room where you can work through issues as well as a lot of uh, digital resources you can look at and work through yourself. Um, we have seen an incredible surge in demand in help seeking behaviour over the last 12 months. And, uh, you know, we came uh, into last year with the peak of demand around bushfires. And we just came through that and thinking, wow, that was a huge experience. And then COVID hit mm -hmm. and on the year rolled. 
And at various points of the year, if you compared that month with the month the year before, uh, Beyond Blue was seeing 50, 60, 70 percent increases in help seeking. So it's been enormous. Um, most of the Beyond Blue team is based in Melbourne. So individually, they were also living through the uh, various lockdowns, including the very long lockdown. So all the stresses and strains everybody else was living with, with homeschooling and the like. People were trying to do their best, surge, uh, meet this surging demand um, and try and keep things uh, happening on the home front. So it's been enormous. I'm incredibly proud of the team uh, for all of that. But I'm also incredibly proud that they managed to keep happening a major change project that we are investing in internally at Beyond Blue, which is that we want to make sure that we're always innovating and offering better services to the community. And we want to offer a better, in, a better integrated set of services. We call it the big blue door. So you can come through the big blue door and find the help that you need seamlessly. And remarkably, that work has continued apace even during the stresses and strains of the last 12 months. Wow. So for me at the governance level, that's meant, you know, oversight of these things. But really, the burden of that work has been on the shoulders of our magnificent CEO, Georgie Harmon, and the extraordinary team she leads. Um, did you expect uh, that Beyond Blue would become I expect you always knew it would be a challenge, but um, such a challenge and so timely when you when you took up your position. Well, I didn't foresee uh, <laughs> I didn't foresee this, no. Uh, but I did um, take over Beyond Blue, knowing that there were a set of things that uh, I wanted to work with the team on to strengthen it for the future. Uh, I took over Beyond Blue after Jeff Kennett, who originated Beyond Blue, had been there for 17 years. Uh, Jeff and I don't see eye to eye on many things, but I'm very admiring of the work that he put in to build Beyond Blue. Mm -hmm. And it does say something, I think, pretty important that in the partisan world in which we live, uh, that a former Liberal politician wanted to visibly send a message about how, how bipartisan Beyond Blue is by handing over to a former Labor politician. So uh, I've sought to live up to that uh, and to be ever strengthening Beyond Blue for the future. And if I may say so, I think it's a credit to both of you because uh, as you say, um, it's uh, politics can be very partisan and it's been hyper partisan in, of recent times and so you know the two of you working together and handing over that baton is um, something that perhaps we can aspire to. I had one more question um, before I know Margaret's got a question about education which is um, obviously a, a shared passion um, of all of us um, and uh, Margaret if you had some thoughts on this question I'm about to ask uh, also feel free to join in. Um, Julia I was listening just last week to the most recent episode of your podcast because that's what I do um, and <laughs> everyone is called if you haven't listened to it it's called a podcast of one's own and you can find it wherever you find your podcasts. Um, so on your most recent interview, you interviewed the first man to, to be on your podcast, uh, Thomas Shamaro Ramuzic. Apologies if I mispronounced his name. Um, and his book, and I think it's important that it's a he that wrote this book, is provocatively titled, Why Do So Many Incompetent Men Become Leaders and How to Fix It? And it reminded me of a phrase that I learned in um, organisational psychology, you know, two and a half decades ago when I was at university. And I know Thomas is an organisational psychologist. Um, and the phrase I learned was at workplaces, people often get promoted to the level of their incompetence. Um, and he obviously, Thomas talked with you about fixing the system so that better, fairer selection of leaders can be made. Um, and I was wondering, for the benefit of those that haven't yet listened to that podcast, if you could perhaps talk a little bit about what you and Thomas uh, propose as fixes and, and how we might 
let incompetent women um, also <laughs> rise to the level of their incompetence, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to talk about that. And I would strongly recommend Thomas's book with its very provocative title. Uh, before the pandemic uh, hit in our world, I used to recommend that everybody buy a copy and read it in the most public place that they possibly could <laughs> uh, so that people would be intrigued by this title about incompetent men. Uh, but what's uh, very interesting about Thomas's work is Thomas is not someone who uh, came to talking about these issues through the prism of gender studies. He's a business psychologist. And so he set out on a journey to work out in an evidence-based way what are the personal characteristics that successful leaders show. And if you could work that out, obviously, then it would better inform businesses about who to select for the next leadership position and the next leadership position. And what he found when he did that very scientific work is that some of the things that we intuitively think are correlated with strong leadership skills, confidence, charisma, a bit of swagger, that when you break it all down in a very methodical way, these things aren't predictors of leadership success. Better predictors of leadership success are things like self-doubt, being prepared to be curious and ask questions, uh, being prepared to build on a high-performing team and to rely on their work. And as he drew all of this out, increasingly he then started to see the gender patterns here, that actually we were selecting men who tended more often to show the confidence and charisma, and we were insufficiently selecting women, even though the character traits they displayed were better predictors of leadership success. And so he would say, if he was here, that we don't fix gender in workplaces by talking about gender. We fix gender in workplaces by uh, talking about how we perceive and measure merit and he then goes on to say, if we did that fairly, we would disproportionately see women coming through from, for leadership, given what we know about the traits that men and women show as leaders. Now, I do want to put one caveat in all of that, which is uh, I don't believe, and the neuroscience doesn't show, that men and women's brains are somehow wired differently, that men are from Mars, women are from Venus, all that stuff was around, you know, a few years ago, and it's just not right. Our brains are wired the same, but obviously how we are socially conditioned is different. And therefore the mix of traits that we bring to the workplace and to the task of leadership is different. So it's fascinating work. Uh, I've very much drawn on it. Um, when the book on women and leadership, I co-authored with a great friend of mine, Dr. Ngozi Okonja Iwela. That's terrific. And, uh... She has just um, been appointed to a pretty important role. She certainly has. She's just been made uh, the head of the World Trade Organization. Uh, we talk in our book about this phenomenon called the glass cliff. So I think most people are familiar with the glass ceiling when women uh, you know, are striving for that final leap the president of the United States or vice chancellor of a university and don't get there. They hit their head on that high glass ceiling as Hillary Clinton did. Uh, but I think people are less familiar with the glass cliff, but the glass cliff is a uh, researchable, trackable phenomenon where organisations in trouble are more likely to appoint women leaders. So if things are going well, they say to themselves, let's get a, the next leader a fair bit like the old leader so they get another man. When things are going badly, they say, let's shake it up, let's try something new. Well, I know we could appoint the first woman. And Ngozi describes uh, potentially being the first woman to lead the World Trade Organization as a glass cliff, a glass <laughs> cliff moment. She's also the first person of color to do the job, uh, but I think she will do a terrific job. Well, having I didn't read your book, I listened to it as an audio book. Um, and having listened to your book and heard about her life journey and um, her achievements, uh, I think that your faith is very well placed. And I'd encourage people to read your book too. It's um, terrific. I suspect Joan Kerner, if she was able to be here, would have had some uh, words to say about the glass cliff as well. 
Um, Margaret, uh, I think it's high time I uh, give you um, the conch and give you the opportunity um, to ask Julia or perhaps have a conversation um, with Julia about that joint shared passion you have, education. Um, thank you, Peter. And uh, I very much enjoyed that last question and answer. <laughs> and so let me sort of yeah. come from that point. Um, Julia, as many of the audience may know, was indeed not, not only the, the first female prime minister, but she was for a considerable time and very successfully the education minister uh, for Australia. And indeed in that time uh, introduced, speaking of university education, um, an access that allowed all those who were capable in Australia to go to university. That's since been reversed, but I think that was a, a, a really strong statement and testament to her commitment to access to education as a way of benefiting all people. So I just wanted to ask you two things because I know your interest in education goes beyond, beyond Australia. And clearly Australia is a relatively advantaged nation, even though there's much that we could do to make people better off. If you had something that you thought was most important to put in place in education to assist with your commitment to greater gender equality in Australia, what would it be? And if you look to much of the, much of the rest of the world that where women do not get any kind of equal access to education, what would it be? And so I, I just want you to contrast what you think in Australia and what well, or countries like Australia and what you think about the rest of the world about education and gender equality. We'd sure, like to give you three question. hours. Sorry, Julia. <laughs> That's right. give you three hours to answer that. Um, but I'm, just, I'm slightly conscious that we don't have quite that. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, do it in under three hours, Peter. I promise. Um, I that that is a fantastic question, Margaret, and thank you for it. If I can start with the world, uh, the problem that we still need to solve in our world is a problem about access to school education and to quality school education. So pre-pandemic, the statistics were that 250 million children of school age were not in school and hundreds of millions more went to schools of such poor quality or for, for such a short amount of time for their, of their lives uh, that they emerged not able to, day, to do the most basic literacy and numeracy. And if you break this down into place, you know, there's, uh, if you were in Malawi, in Africa, for example, the chance of a girl going to uh, the end of secondary school, so a full cycle of schooling, 12 years of schooling, one in 10 girls will achieve that. Most girls will not complete primary school. Uh, and yet we know that if you educate girls, you get on a virtuous cycle. Uh, educated girls become educated women. Uh, generally, they choose to have uh, uh, fewer children. Uh, the children that they do have are more likely to survive infanthood, more likely to be vaccinated, more likely to go to schools themselves. The money women earn is more likely to be put into uh, family resources. Uh, and women become change agents in their community through education. So if I had a magic wand, I would want to fix that problem globally. But what we know from our own society is that, you know, equalising education isn't in and of itself the panacea for gender equality. If it was, then we would be living in a gender equal Australia because it's been some time now that just on the raw statistics, uh, more women have achieved higher education than men. So there are other things going on. Of the things that I think we need to therefore change in our education is it's not so much the numbers, do women get to complete school, go on to vocational education and training or university, it's the sex segregation that remains in courses of study. So we know that disproportionately science, technology, engineering and maths courses are 
um, courses that men take and their professions that, that men pursue. And they are the professions that are building so much of our future, given how ubiquitous technology is and important to what we're going to do next. So if I could have a magic wand for Australia, it would be that, uh, the distribution in terms of uh, men and women uh, across education and across all aspects of it that I'd want to change. If anyone out there has a magic wand, you know the woman to give it to. <laughs> Um, look, I, I am, um, for very selfish reasons, hesitant to do this because um, I, uh, I can't remember the last time I enjoyed myself uh, so much. Um, but Julia and Margaret, I am going to have to wrap up because it's 7.31 and we were supposed to finish at 7.30. Um, and I am confident that I speak on behalf of everyone who's had this incredible opportunity, Julia, to hear from you so personally that we are incredibly grateful that you um, agreed to present the inaugural Louisa Dunkley oration. Um, Sina and Beth um, and Macalia from Mahogany Rise Primary School, but now at um, Monterey Secondary College and Frankston High School, um, the three of them, Thank you for your representation of our community. I think that Margaret and Julia would, you would both agree, um, they are fine young women um, who will, I am sure, achieve in Louise's footsteps. Margaret and Monash University um, Peninsula Campus, you're very important to our community. And um, I very much hope that you remain part of the annual Louisa Dunkley oration. Um, we just, we couldn't be happier um, to have a university in our community. You are all amazing. Thank you everyone who joined us and everyone got emailed this wonderful um, brochure tonight. Please take the time to look at it because the wonderful students who were part of Project O did all of the design work and put it together um, and it's terrific. So thank you again, Julia, just amazing. Thank you. Have a Thank great you night, so everyone. Much, Peter.